Hi, this is Calculus. We're up to lesson 24, three and a half more weeks left, four more weeks left in the term. And for the remaining part of the semester, we're studying integration. And I will explain what that is. So you might have the following problem. Differentiate the function y equal x cubed. And you get dy dx is 3x squared. So one can say, well, yeah, we know how to differentiate. If we, for example, if we have y equals um, tangent of x, then dy dx is secant squared x, and so on. So you might call this the differentiation game, and we can reverse it. Uh, we might say, given a function um, f of x, find a function capital F of x, such that the derivative of capital F of x is equal to little f of x. So for example, <clears throat> find f of x such that df dx is equal to 3x squared. And we know the answer because right up here we see if you take y equal x cubed, then dy dx is 3x squared. So the answer to this problem is at least one answer. You can take f of x, capital F of x, to be 3x squared. So that's a function whose derivative is x cubed. Or find f of x such that the derivative, f prime, capital F prime of x, is equal to secant squared x. And up here, we saw the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared. So what we can call the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent of x. Okay. So, so this is kind of like reversing the process of differentiation. So what we will call the antiderivative of a function f of x is a function capital F of x such that capital F prime of x equals little f of x. So for example, find, I shouldn't say the because there's more than one, find an antiderivative of cosine x. That means we want to find a function f, capital F, such that capital F prime of x is equal to the cosine. And what is the answer? What is a function whose derivative is the cosine? Sine. Yes, sine, thank you. You could have f of x equals sine x because the derivative of the sine of x is the cosine of x. <clears throat> now, if you're asked to find the derivative of a function, there's usually just one answer. 
But if you're asked to find the antiderivative of a function, there can be more than one answer. So what is another function whose derivative is the cosine? Another solution. Suppose we let f of x be equal to sine x plus one. What happens when you differentiate? That's the derivative of the sine of x plus one. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. The derivative of one is zero and cosine x plus zero is cosine x. So if you add one, you just get another antiderivative. And in fact, but there's nothing magical about one. This could be any constant. So C is equal to any number, any constant. And when you differentiate a constant, you always get zero. So this is one small difference between taking derivatives and taking antiderivatives. There's only one derivative, but there's more than one antiderivative. But we'll see in a few minutes that the only way you can have more than one antiderivative is if the two antiderivatives just differ by a constant. So that's that will be a useful fact. You can also restate this problem of finding an antiderivative in terms of what is called a differential equation. A differential equation is an equation where the unknown is a function and the equation involves a derivative. So you could say, find a function y equals capital F of x such that dy dx equals cosine x. So this is what is called a differential equation. It's just a restatement of the problem. Find a function y whose derivative is the cosine. That means find an antiderivative of the cosine. And one solution is y equals sine of x. So that's just an alternate notation, an alternate language. And it's useful to know that, but that's what it is. So here are a couple of problems just to work on right now. Find antiderivatives of the following functions. f of x equals two x. f of x equals five x squared minus seven x plus three. f of x equals e to the x. f of x equals one over x. f of x equals one over x squared plus one. So here are my functions. What's an antiderivative of x? What is a function whose derivative is equal to x? Can someone figure that out? Any suggestions? Any answers? What is the derivative of x? One. 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 Well, right, okay. But that's the derivative, but we need to find the antiderivative. Hmm. I'll give you a hint. You know that for any n, the derivative of x to the n is n x to the n minus one. So for antiderivatives, the antiderivative of n x to the n minus one is x to the n. 
Now we want an antiderivative. We want a function. Where the antiderivative is um, right. derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus one. So the antiderivative of nx to the n minus one is x to the n. This is an is, is x to the n. So suppose we let n equal to three then an antiderivative of when n is three, n minus one is two. So if you have three x squared, an antiderivative will be x cubed. The derivative of x cubed is three x squared. So x cubed is the antiderivative of, of three x squared. Actually, that's true, but I'm more interested in the case. Suppose we let n equal two. When n is two, this says the antiderivative of two x is x squared, right? The derivative of x squared is two x. <clears throat> but we want an antiderivative of x. So x is one half the derivative of x squared, which is the same as the derivative of a half x squared. If you differentiate a half x squared, you get x. And that's the answer. Differentiate a half x squared, you get a half times two x, a half times two is one, you're left with x. So an antiderivative of x is one half x squared. But you differentiate this and you get x. Right. Are there questions about this? No question, professor. Question or not? No. Anyone else? What about e to the x? What is an antiderivative of e to the x? I would say the same. E to the x. Sorry, I didn't hear. E to the x. Exactly. This is the unique function whose derivative is equal to itself. If you let capital F of X be E to the X, F prime of X is just E to the X. So E to the X is the antiderivative of E to the X. What's an antiderivative of one over X? What's the function whose derivative is one over X? Log X. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Natural log of x. What about 1 over x squared plus 1? What's a function whose derivative is 1 over x squared plus 1? Our tangent of x? Exactly correct. That is, you can't find antiderivatives if you don't know derivatives. Let's see, what about 5x squared minus 7x plus 3? Hmm. Let me explain something first and then we'll come back to that one. What's the simplest differentiation formulas? The derivative of x to the n. The derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1. So the antiderivative of n x to the n minus one is x to the n. What about the derivative of x to the n plus one? That's n plus one times x to the n. So the antiderivative of n plus one x to the n is x to the n plus one. That just means the derivative with respect to x of n plus one x to the n is x to the n plus one. But of course the derivative of a constant times a function 
you can always bring the constant outside. This is n plus one times the derivative of x to the n. So this is a very nice formula. If you divide by n plus one, you get the derivative Oops. Uh, yeah, you get um, I, mean, I, I think I read. So the derivative of x to the n plus one is n plus one x to the n. So that's silly. Let me just do this properly. Um, so the derivative with respect to x of x to the n plus one is n plus one x to the n, which means x to the n is one over n plus one, the derivative of x to the n plus one. And you can always take a constant and bring it inside the derivative sign. This is the derivative with respect to x of one over n plus one x to the n plus one. Of course, you can't divide by zero. So this is only true for n plus one not equal to zero or n not equal to minus one. But if n is different from minus one, x to the n is the derivative of this function. So what does that say? It says that the anti-derivative of x to the n is this, one over n plus one x to the power n plus one for all n not equal to minus one. So this is the simplest and also the most important antiderivative um, in some sense. Let me write it down again over here. For n not equal to minus one, the derivative with respect to x of one over n plus one x to the n plus one is equal to x to the n. Or another way of saying that is the antiderivative of x to the n, again, x not equal to minus one, is one over n plus one x to the n plus one. Give that a little star because that's really important. Any questions about this? This is like a fundamental formula. So for example, what is the antiderivative of x to the 23? Well, when n is equal to the 23, so let's just say the antiderivative of x to the 23 is 1 over 23 plus 1 x to the 23 plus 1, which is known to the world as 1 over 24 x to the 24. You differentiate this function, you get x to the 23. Any questions about this? What is the anti-derivative of five times x to the seventh? Well, an anti-derivative of x to the seventh is one eighth x to the eighth. And if you multiply that by five, you'll get an antiderivative of five x to the seventh. So this is just five eighths x to the eighth. That's the answer. Differentiate this, you get five eighths times eight, so that's just five x to the seventh.
So this is like a new thing to do in calculus. Up until this point in Math 175, you've been given a function and told to find the derivative. Here, it's the opposite. Here, you're given the derivative and asked to find the function. And another name for the anti-derivative is the indefinite, the is important, the indefinite integral. And we write the notation as follows. The antiderivative of 5x to the seventh, we write this elongated sort of S or curve, 5x to the seventh dx. This just means find the antiderivative of 5x to the seventh. And you would write this as the following formula. The integral of 5x to the seventh dx is equal to 5 eighths x to the eighth. And then I should point out, you can actually add any constant to this because the right-hand side just means a function whose derivative is 5x to the seventh. And because the derivative of a constant is zero, no matter what the constant, this derivative is just the derivative of 5 eighths x to the eighth. So now we've been introduced to half of integration. There is something called the definite integral, which has some geometrical meaning as the area under a curve. And the indefinite integral, that's what we're looking at here, which is the antiderivative of the function. So, Let's find some antiderivatives using our integral notation. What is the integral of cosine x plus x? Hmm. Let's see, we can break this into two parts, perhaps. What is the integral of cosine x? And what is the integral of x? So what are these two indefinite integrals or antiderivatives equal to? What's the integral of cosine of x? Can someone tell me? Sine x. Sine x. And what's the integral of x? One half x squared. Exactly. So the integral of cosine x plus x, you can just do it term by term. This is sine x plus a half x squared. Because when you differentiate the right hand side, you get cosine x plus x. You get exactly that. Now, let me just say something about the uniqueness of antiderivatives. So suppose we have a function little f of x and that capital F of x and capital G of x be antiderivatives of some function little f of x. So what that means is that if you differentiate f prime of x, you get little f of x. And if you differentiate g prime of x, you get little f of x. So suppose we consider the function h of x to be f of x minus g of x. So what is h prime of x, the derivative? The derivative of a difference of two functions is the difference of the derivatives. 
but both derivatives are equal to f of x. So you get f of x minus f of x. So this is zero for all x. Suppose you take two numbers a and b, a let's say a less than b, then h of b minus h of a over b minus a, that's h prime of c for oh, sorry, can, can we see? between a and b by the mean value theorem. So let me write this down again on a new sheet of paper. We have functions capital F and capital G and F prime of X and G prime of X are equal to some function F of X on some interval I. So if we let H of X be F of X minus G of X, then H prime of X is F prime of X minus G prime of X but that's just little f of x times minus little f of x. That's equal zero. So the derivative is zero for all x on the interval. Now by the mean value theorem, mean value theorem, f of b minus f of a so for all a, b in the interval, f of b minus f of a is, sorry, h of b minus h of a, h is f, capital F minus capital G. That's h prime of x times b minus a, but h prime of x is zero. So for every a and b, h of a equals h of b, implies h of x is a constant, c. So f of x minus g of x is c, or f of x equals g of x plus c. So whenever you have two functions that are antiderivatives of the same function, they differ just by a constant. So that's an important fact to know. Any questions about this? So this is a brand new subject and it comes exactly at this point in the syllabus. We're not behind and we're not ahead, but it does mean in the last few weeks of the semester, you have to learn a whole new way of thinking about calculus. Up to this point, we've only had to find derivatives. Now we have to find antiderivatives or as they are called integrals. And the important point to remember is every differentiation formula is an anti-differentiation formula. Or integral formula. So for example, the derivative with respect to x of log x is one over x, which means the antiderivative or the integral of one over x dx is log x plus a constant. So for example, the derivative with respect to x 
of 7x cubed minus 5x squared plus 9x minus 2 is equal to 21 x squared minus 10 x plus 9. So the antiderivative or the indefinite integral of 21 x squared minus 10 x plus 9 is going to be 7 x cubed minus 5 x squared plus 9 x plus some constant. The derivative of this function is this. The antiderivative of this is that. But the derivative of the constant is zero, so you can't actually, I just leave that out actually. Makes it a little bit better. Seven x cubed minus five x squared plus nine x, the derivative is this. So the antiderivative of 21 x squared minus 10 x plus nine is this, plus a constant. So do we need to put the C, the plus C at the end? Uh, it's better if you do. And, you know, for this course, the final is made by the department. And I think the department's rule is that you take off a point if you don't put down the C. So it's better not to lose a point. So just write plus C when you can. Right. So here's an interesting problem. What is the antiderivative of one over X squared? And I'll give you a hint, one over x squared is the same as x to the minus two. And I'll give you another hint. As we saw before, the derivative of x to the n plus one is n plus one x to the n which implies that the antiderivative of x to the n is one over n plus one x to the n plus one. And this expression is true for all n not equal to negative one. Because if, yes, if n were negative one, this would be zero. So if I'm trying to solve this problem to find the antiderivative or the indefinite integral of x to the minus two, that's exactly this with n equal to negative two. In this formula, if I plug in n equal negative two, I get one over minus two plus one x to the minus two plus one. Minus two plus one is minus one. So one over minus one is just minus x to the minus one or minus one over x. So the antiderivative of x to the minus two is minus one over x. And you can check the derivative of minus one over x is equal to one over x squared.
What are some rules about antiderivatives? Well, because every differentiation formula leads to an integral formula, let's review two of the basic rules about derivatives. One says the derivative of a constant times the function is a constant times the derivative of the function. So that says that Let's see, how can I express this? So let capital, all right, this is capital F. So let capital F prime of X be equal to little f of X. So, The derivative of C times capital F of X is C times the derivative of capital F of X. That's C times little f of X. If F prime of capital F prime is an antiderivative or integral of little f of X. So C times F of X is the integral of C times little f of X. And capital F of X is the integral of little f of x. So this is c times the integral of little f of x is the integral of c times f of x dx. In other words, when you have an integral, if you have a constant inside the integral sign, you can always bring it out. So the integral of um, 7x is 7 times the integral of x. And the integral of x is a half x squared plus a constant. So this is 7 halves x squared plus 7 times an arbitrary constant, which is just an arbitrary constant. Another rule is, if you take the sum of two functions, The derivative of the sum of two functions is the sum of the derivatives. And let's suppose the derivatives of capital F or little f and a derivative of capital G is little g of x. So that says if I differentiate f of x plus g of x, I get little f plus g of x. So the integral of f of x plus g of x dx is this. Capital f of x plus capital g of x. And capital f of x was the antiderivative of f of x and capital g of x was the antiderivative of little g of x. So we have now the following two basic rules for integrals. Or for antiderivatives, again, that's always the same thing. Well, really three basic rules. So for n not equal to minus one, the integral of x to the n dx is one over x plus one, x to the n plus one plus a constant. The only other case is when n is equal to minus one, the integral of x to the n dx, that's the integral of x to the minus one dx or the integral of one over x dx. And you know that one over x is the derivative of the natural log of x plus a constant. So we have this rule for the integral of one over X. So every power is either minus one or it's not. And we now can differentiate all powers. We also have that the integral of C times F of X, you take the constant outside of C times the integral of F of X. And the integral of f of x plus g of x dx is the sum of the integrals.
So we have one, two, three, and four are four fundamental properties of integration or of the process of taking the indefinite integral. So let's see, what was that problem I stated early on? Now we know enough to solve it. It was find the antiderivative of the integral of 5x squared minus 7x plus 3 dx. So using this property, this is the integral of 5x squared minus the integral of 7x plus the integral of 3. And using the fact that we take constants outside the integration sign, this is 5 times the integral of x squared minus 7 times the integral of x plus 3 times the integral of just 1. Now, what is a function whose derivative is x squared? Well, if you let n equal to 2 in this, in this formula, when n is 2, the integral of x squared is 1 over 3x cubed. So this is 1 over 3x cubed. Here, this is x to the first power. When n is equal to 1, the integral of x is 1 over 2x squared. This is minus 7 over 2x squared. And 1, 1 is like x to the 0. When n is 0, this is 1x, just x. So plus 3x. And you can check that this truly is the antiderivative of this function. Just differentiate this term by term. You get 5x squared minus 7x plus 3. So this all fits together very nicely. Okay. Questions about this? This is a lot of new material coming on us very quickly at the end of the semester. What about initial conditions and particular solutions? So for example, suppose we have the problem, what is the integral of x squared dx? It's a third x cubed plus any constant. Or, yeah, or another way of saying that is if you want to solve the solution of the differential equation. Professor. Yeah. But what about uh, the past exercise? You didn't put uh, like plus the constant C. I'm sorry. Oh. The one you did. Oh, before. back here? Yes. Yes. So it's equal to this. Oops, yes. This is a plus here. And you can add any constant C. Exactly. So, okay. So, there are infinitely many solutions for every choice of constant. But what I have said is in every integration problem, it's unique up to an additive constant. And sometimes you forget to write it down 
I don't worry about that very much, but on the final exam where the department grading rules are in effect, you have to remember to put the plus C, but you need to know that there always is a constant you can add. So what is the antiderivative or the integral of X squared DX? A third X cubed plus a constant. Or another way of saying this is, if you want to solve the differential equation dy dx equals x squared, the solution is y equals, sorry, y equals one third x cubed plus any constant. So this is what you would call the general solution. But you might have the following problem. Find the particular solution of the differential equation dy dx equals x squared that satisfies the initial condition that for the solution y, when you evaluate it at, let's say, 0, it's equal to 8. So we know the general solution is y equals a third x cubed plus c. When you evaluate this at x equals 0, y at 0 is a third 0 cubed plus c. That's just c, but that has to equal 8. So c is equal to 8. So when you add an initial condition to the general problem, you find a particular solution, which in this case is y is equal to one third x cubed plus eight. So this is the only solution of this, of this problem. You have to find the integral of uh, x squared that also satisfies that at x equals zero, the value of the function is eight. That's, so this is the particular solution to this problem with an initial condition. Let's see, here's another example. Find the general solution to the equation f prime of x equals e to the x. Find the particular solution to f prime of x equals e to the x and the initial condition that when x is zero, f of zero is equal to three. So these are two problems. The solution to one is, one particular solution is e to the x plus a general constant. That's the general solution. And for the particular solution, find the constant c such that f of zero equals three. Well, what is f of zero? f of zero is e to the zero plus c. e to the zero is one, so this is one plus c. And if that's going to equal three, then c has to equal two. So the particular solution we want is f of x equals e to the x plus two. So this is the particular solution with this particular initial condition, and this is the general solution. You can see here, if you plug in x equals zero, f of zero is e to the zero plus two, e to the zero is one, one plus two is three. So it checks.
let's look at a um, kind of a physics type problem. This is example eight in this section of the text. It says a ball is thrown upward with an initial velocity of 64 feet per second. And from an initial height of 80 feet. Find the position of the ball as a function of time. And also find the time at which the ball hits the ground. So let's solve this problem, this solution. Suppose we let S of T, so the height of the ball above the ground. So S at time zero is 80 feet. And the derivative of this position is the velocity. So S prime of T, that's the initial velocity is 64. We also know, sorry, it's S prime of zero. We also know that acceleration due to gravity that is S double prime of T, that's the acceleration of the particle, is minus 32 feet per second squared. So we have the second derivative is equal to minus 32. Another way of saying this is the derivative with respect to t is s prime of t. Professor, how did you get uh, the second derivative? Oh, we're told this is, this is part of the statement of the problem. Acceleration due to gravity, that is, if, you if S is the position, the first derivative is the velocity, the second derivative is the acceleration. That's the definition of acceleration, is the second derivative. And we're told that in units of feet and seconds, it's equal to minus 32 feet per square second. So I'm not saying it in the problem. Right? I'm not saying the second derivative in the problem. No? You mean in the statement of the problem? Yeah, in the statement. It's not there. You have to come up with the idea that you need the second derivative in order to solve the problem. You know, you want to find the position. Now, if you know the velocity, you might be able to find the position. But you also don't know the velocity. You just know an initial value for the velocity. But if you know the second derivative, then you can find the first derivative, right? So let's say we, the first thing we want to do is find the velocity V of T, which is S prime of T, find the velocity for all T. And what do we know? We know two things. We know that the derivative of the velocity, acceleration a of t, which is the derivative of the velocity, which means the second derivative of the function, is equal to minus 32. So,
So S prime of T is the antiderivative of S double prime of T. Because if you differentiate the first derivative, you get the second derivative. So S prime of T is the integral of S double prime of T dt. But we're told that the second derivative, which is the acceleration, is minus 32 feet per second. That's minus 32. Minus 32. What's the derivative of 1? Well, that's just integral of 1 dt. That's minus 32. The integral of 1 is t plus a constant. So S prime of T, the velocity is minus 32 T plus a constant. Right. So we're working our way backwards. We know the second derivative. So by integrating, we can find the first derivative. When we have the first derivative, by integrating, we can find the function, which is what we want. So the second derivative is a constant, it's minus 32. So the first derivative is the integral of minus 32, that's minus 32 t plus c. So this is the general formula for s prime. But we also have the initial condition s prime of zero is 64. So when you plug at t equals zero into this, s prime of zero is minus 32 t plus c that's 32 times zero, that's just C, and that's equal to 64. So my constant has to be 64. So the velocity or the first derivative is minus 32 T plus 64. Professor, I cannot see you. So S prime of T is minus 32 T plus 64, check. What's the derivative of this? It's minus 32. The second derivative is minus 32. That's what it has to be. What is this when t equals zero? When t equals zero, it's 64. That's the initial condition. So S prime of t is this. So that's the antiderivative of S of t. That is the integral S of t is the antiderivative of S prime of t. That's the antiderivative of minus 32 t plus 64. What is this integral? Minus 32, the antiderivative of t is t squared over two plus 64, the antiderivative of one is t plus a constant. So S of t is minus 16 t squared plus 64 t plus a constant. And we're told when t is zero, the height is 80. S of zero is minus 16 times zero squared plus 64 times zero plus c is 80. That's all zero, c is equal to 80. So we get our solution that s of t is minus 16 t squared plus 64 t plus 80. So we know the second derivative. We can integrate to find the first derivative. When we know the first derivative, we can integrate again to find the function. That's what we do. When does the ball hit the ground? Ball hits ground when S of T is zero. So we have to solve this equation minus 16 t squared plus 64 t plus 80 equals zero. That's a quadratic equation. I can simplify by dividing 
um, by 16, by minus 16. This is the same as t squared minus 4t minus 5 equals 0. I just divide by 16. This is t minus 5 times t plus 1. So the solutions are minus 1 and 5. You can't go backwards in time. So t is equal to 5 seconds. That's the time at which the height above the ground is 0. That means when the ball hits the ground. Okay, well, let's do some problems. Compute the integral of x plus 7 dx. So spend a minute or two and work this out yourself. This is the integral of x dx plus the integral of 7 dx, which is the same as the integral of x dx plus 7 times the integral of 1 dx. What is the integral of x? What is the integral of 1? You find them and plug them in, and you'll get the solution. One half x squared um, plus seven x. Right, so this is a half x squared yeah, plus seven x plus seven x plus, plus constant. Let's make it more challenging. What about the integral of x plus 6 over the square root of x? That actually looks quite complicated. But we can simplify it a little bit. That is, this, I mean, doing integrals takes skill. Doing derivatives doesn't take any imagination at all. You just work them out. You have rules. But here, you have to be a little bit clever. Let me write this as a sum of two fact fractions. This is x over the square root of x plus 6 over the square root of x. And x over the square root of x is the square root of x. And I can write this as two integrals, in fact, plus the integral of 6 over the square root of x dx. Now, I don't know how to integrate this square root symbol unless I remember the square root of a number is just the number raised to the power of half. So this is the integral of x to the 1 half dx. Let me take the 6 outside. So you can take a constant outside the symbol of integration, 1 over the square root of x. Of course, 1 over the square root of x, that's 1 over x to the 1 half. So this is x to the 1 half dx plus 6 times the integral. 1 over x to the 1 half is, one over, is no 1 over. It's x to the minus a half dx. And once it's in this form, you can use the rule that the integral of x to the n for any n, positive or negative, is 1 over n plus 1 x to the n plus 1 plus constant. So use this formula here and here and see if you can get the right answer. When you use this formula with n equal to a half, you get 1 over a half plus 1 
x to the half plus one. A half plus one is three halves. And one over three halves is two thirds. So this first expression is two thirds x to the three halves. Here we have n equals minus a half. Let me do that in a side box over here. Remember the formula, integral of x to the n is x to the n plus one over n plus one plus a constant. So when n is minus a half, you get the integral of x to the minus a half is x to the minus a half plus one over minus a half plus one. One minus a half is a half. So this is the square root of x over a half or two times the square root of x. So this is plus six times two times the square root of x plus the constant. And that's the answer. Are there questions about this? Again, there should be because this is brand new and it's completely new and takes a while to understand what's going on. Page 18. What about the integral of y squared times the square root of y, dy? Doesn't matter what variable we use for our, in our integrals. So you have to write this as a power. y squared is y squared. Square root of y is y to the half. So this is the integral of y to the two plus a half. That's y to the five halves. So this is my n is equal to five halves. This is one over n plus one, five halves plus one, x to the five halves plus one. This is seven halves. The reciprocal of seven halves is two sevenths, x to the seven halves plus a constant. Here, another problem. Solve the differential equation h prime of t is equal to eight t cubed plus five with the initial condition h at one is equal to four. 
So we want to find a function whose derivative is ATQ plus five and satisfies this initial condition. So H of T is the antiderivative of H prime of T. That's the integral of AT cubed plus five DT. This is A times the integral of T cubed DT. I'm just expanding this plus five times the integral of one dt. If you add one to three, you get four. So you get eight over four t to the fourth plus five t plus a constant or two t to the fourth plus five t plus a constant. That's what h of t is equal to. When you differentiate this, you get AT cubed plus five. When T is equal to one, what do we get? We get two times one plus five times one plus a constant. That's seven plus a constant and that's supposed to equal four, which means C is negative three. Seven minus three is four. So the solution is h of t equals 2t to the fourth plus 5t minus 3. I think, well, I mean, there should be questions because this is all brand new. Uh, and there's a lot of homework problems to work on and I'll go over some of them on Wednesday. Um, let me just continue a little bit more today. The antiderivative is called the indefinite integral. So you might ask, is there something called the definite integral? And to explain the meaning of the definite integral, we can go back to some geometry. For example, suppose we have y equals the sine of x for x between zero and pi. So the graph of the sine of x from zero to pi looks like this. At pi over two, the value of the sine is one. And we can ask, what is the area under the curve? Under the curve sine x between zero and pi. That's a classical kind of geometrical question. Or, we could have the function y equals x cubed. So to make it easier, just the parabola, y equal x squared, say from minus one to plus one. So it looks like that. The height is one minus, this is plus one, zero, minus one. We can ask, what is the area under the parabola? This region I'm shading in right here. What is this area under, above the x-axis and below the parabola? What is the area? So 
I'm going to go a little bit backwards now and, and just tell you exactly what it is. And then we'll explain part of this on Wednesday. So the notation for this area, suppose you have a function y equals f of x for x between a and b. And suppose that on this interval, first of all, f of x is greater than or equal to zero. So the graph of this function between a and b is something that looks like this. And the area is what we call the definite integral of the function f of x on the interval from a to b. And we write that as integral of f of x dx. But now we put the a and the b above and below this symbol for integration. This is just notation. And suppose the integral, the indefinite integral of f of x dx is equal to some function capital F of x. In that case, and this is what's essentially called the fundamental theorem of calculus, this area is capital F of B minus capital F of A. So let's see if we can use this formula to compute the area of one loop of the sine curve. So remember, if we have F of x equals sine x, capital F of x, which is the indefinite integral of the sine of x, is equal to minus the cosine of x. Right, that is, oops, from zero to pi. Professor, y minus cosine of pi over two. So is there a question? Yes. Why you say uh, is minus uh, cosine of x? If you differentiate minus the cosine, you get the sine. Okay. So the integral of the sine is minus cosine. So the area under the curve, which we write as the integral from zero to pi sine x dx is this function capital F evaluated at pi minus capital F evaluated at zero. Capital F of x is minus the cosine. This is minus the cosine of pi minus minus the cosine of zero. Cosine of pi is minus one. So this is minus minus one, minus times minus is plus cosine zero, which is one. This is one plus one or two. So this area is exactly two units. It's quite remarkable. Um, so using what is called the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can actually calculate this area. And what about the other example I gave? Where we take y equal x squared for x between minus one and plus one And I want to find the area under the curve. So if I let capital F of X be the integral of X squared DX, that's one third X cubed plus a constant, but I don't need the constant here. So the area is F of one minus F of minus one. F of one is one third one cubed minus f of minus one, which is one third minus one cubed. One cubed is one, minus one cubed is minus one, minus times minus is plus, and a third plus a third is two thirds. So the area under this curve from minus one to one is equal to two thirds. So we'll see more on Wednesday that 
The definite integral, that just means the antiderivative of a function and the, sorry, the indefinite integral. And the definite integral tells you the area under a curve and you can calculate it using the indefinite integral. So this is a, a huge amount that I did today. Um, there's a lot of brand new material in calculus here, but basically this is exactly um, what we cover in this course on integration. And you'll have, you have a number of homework problems to do. And as always, the more you do, the better. Professor. Yes. On the homework, there is a homework uh, number 13 and we don't have a 13 on this, on the guideline. So I don't know. I mean on the Blackboard website? Yes. I'll add it as soon as we get off today. Okay. I'll add it right away. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Okay, everyone. Um, back on Wednesday, especially now that we're doing a new topic. If you have questions and you need to want to have a, like a private session with me on Zoom, send me an email and we'll arrange a time. It's, it's, I'm more than willing to do this almost every day of the week. So if you have any questions and you want a private one-on-one -on -one Zoom session, just email me and we'll set up the time. Okay. Okay, that's it for today then. Be back on Wednesday. Bye, everyone. Bye.